ascension at the top can the kingdom, which is the child of the throne, escape home. Rosencrantz Krantz and Guildenstein. Uh, sorry, Rosencrantz speaking here in Hamlet. Anybody would like to read this one? The seas of majesty dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. It is a massy wheel fixed on the sunnet of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and joined, and adjoined, which when it falls, each small and excellent petty consequence attends the boisterous ruin. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. <coughs> now look at that concept. It is a massy wheel, okay? Fixed on the sunlet of the highest mount, on, on whose large spokes 10,000 lesser things are mortised and adjoined. So these things here are socketed into that. This spinning, which we said before, this swastika image of the rolling, if we put arrows on here, you can see it's spinning a bit better. If you put those on there, that's the massy wheel. It's the spinning, and all these thousands of little body parts here, or the little cells inside the body, or the planets inside the universe, are all paying service to the central pinion point. Remember, T.S. Eliot talks about the still point of the turning world. The still point is in the middle. This part here is going like the clappers. The edges here are moving at a tremendous rate. If you spot here, this thing is going really quite quickly. As you go in towards the center, the speed is slowing down and down and down. And at the center point, it's still, and it's just revolving. So the still point of the turning wheel is exactly the same reference point we're talking about here. The central point, the governance here, is the actual s fixed point of the massy wheel on whose huge spokes 10,000 lesser things are mortised and adjoined. Which when it falls, if this centre does not hold, if the centre cannot hold, everything breaks up. So the governance is terribly important in that sense, is what Shakespeare is saying here. And it's so important that, you know, we have to literally support it, but at the same time, um, moderate it constantly. The kingdom is the mirror of its king. We cannot examine either without conjuring the image of the other. The monarch initiates the change which models his substantial state from moment to moment. The substance opposes that change because it's in it, it is in its nature inert, resistant, referring the status quo. In the resistance of the realm, the flesh, the royal will is proved, made manifest retained. When I was talking to Eugene about yoga, he said to me that the body is resistance. In fact, the word body means resistance in its original form. He said, when you say cloth has body, you mean it resists you. If it doesn't resist you, it's negligible. In fact, a lady's negligee is a negligible, non-resistant, <laughs> non-body of cloth. It's very light. When we say something has body, we mean it has weight and substance, and it resists effort. When you're doing yoga, you're moving a resistant body. You're making it pliant to you, literally bending. You're bending it in, and rebending it in different directions. You're forming it into, by the nature of your will, and holding it into a place. So you're taking resistance and changing the nature of that resistance. You're working with your own substantial resistance all the time. So you're organizing your body polity. You're governing it gently, listening to it, because you have to consider that that body is actually intelligent. And remember, Eugene considered that the body was very, very ancient. Because your body's never died. You got it from your mum and dad, and they got it from your grandfather, and your grandmother, and your grandfather. And it's been alive all that time. It never died. It's never gone. It didn't go to the grave with your, with your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. It's been alive all the time. 
So the information in it is extremely intelligent. It's patterned with sophisticated intelligence. Every time you blink your eyes, you're remembering the fact that we came out of the sea and we needed water to keep our vision moist. So you still do that every now and again when your eyes get dry. So this body has, has got ancient patterning in it. So you listen to it very sensitively, but you still control it. Okay? So this is body written out, and that's got more body than a single sheet. So body literally means resistance. So you've got your own resistance here. You've got your own kingdom, your earthly little planet here, your little earth. We see the realm as the orb or sphere the king holds in his hand. It is a symbol in little of the great globe of the earth itself. Shakespeare the Shakespeare's theatre of operation is also a globe consciously so called. The law that governs spheres, and without law there can be no sphere, is the same for all of them, big or small. What is true of the creation is true of the individual sphere of man, or that of a Shakespearean drama. Every sphere of operation is a product of an intent on the part of its creator and is a manifestation of his will, and is therefore an image of that creator. That's the same as saying that the king holding that in being, generating it in the first place, is actually separating this guarded place, this garden, like the Garden of Eden, from a wilderness of nothing or other people or other tiny uh, wills, etc., who have separated themselves off in different places or to do different things, whether these are tiny little kexies and, and things and um, briar patches or desert places. They are distinctly separate from this place which we are, which someone has chosen to work upon and to develop. And you can only develop it by working in that sense. But if you don't develop yourself, somebody else will develop you. That's what it's, we, we started off with. As we have observed, each sphere has its particular genius, the unique development intent encapsulated in it from the beginning. In the sphere of a particular Shakespearean drama, its title gives the clue to the intent encapsulated therein. Thus we may look upon Richard II as a sphere of operation in which its chief protagonist displays his character and problems, and really your character is written in problems, within a specific historical context, and amid a host of other historical characters. That is one view. But it is much more rewarding to look upon the eponymous hero as the whole sphere himself, the containing integument within, the, with, with, within which the play takes place. Then your Mowbray, your Hereford, John of Gaunt, and Northumberland become parts or aspects of Richard's own character. The king himself is the play, the war is within himself. Every occurrence and function is that of his own being. This is true of all the histories where the title of the play indicates the eternal drama of the king it names. This king is thus an archetypal aspect of human hierarchical behavior to be explored and developed. Okay? What exactly do you mean by archetypal? Functions of the king. 